Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Oregon Rural Health Conference, hosted by the Oregon Office of Rural Health. My name is Rose Locklear, and I'm a program manager at the Office of Rural Health, and I will be moderating this session today. First, I'd like to thank our partners. At the gold level, we have All Care Health and the Oregon Health Association. At the silver level, we have Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, the Oregon Association of Hospital and Health Systems, River House on the Deschutes, at Bronze, RQI Partners, and at Copper, Westcom, the American College of Education, and Inquisic. Their continued support during these difficult times has made it possible for us to offer the conference to you all at no cost, and we're grateful to them. You should have received an email with a link to our conference app. Use this app to visit the partners' virtual booths, enter to win prizes, and network with other folks. Next slide, please. The session evaluation. This will come as a survey uh, that will populate at the end of this session. Please do complete the evaluation. If you've signed up and registered for continuing education credits, you will need to do the survey in order to receive your credits. Um, this is also will give you a chance to win a $100 gift card. It will help us improve this as we move forward. Next slide, please. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today, Diana Hansen from the Central Oregon Disability Support Network, Melissa First from Oregon Family Support Network, and finally, Tamara Bakewell from Oregon Center for Children and Youth with Special Needs. Without further ado, I would like to pass the baton over to my speakers. Next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> My name is Diana Hansen. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Central Oregon Disability Support Network. Next slide. In 2003, my daughter, um, our third child, was born um, here in Central Oregon. She, within two hours, we were given three significant diagnoses. She was born with Down syndrome, she had three holes in her heart, and she had uh, transient leukemia. So within two hours, we were delivered some significant life-changing events. At that time, uh, we were given some information from the social worker who was super sweet. Um, it was a Sunday, she handed us some information and that information that we received that day was very um, <laughs> outdated. It was um, talked about institutions. It talked about some really outdated milestones. It said that she wouldn't dress herself until she was seven to nine. She would never live on her own. She would never drive on and on and on. What we didn't realize for a couple of weeks was the information that we were given in 2003 at her birth, it, the information was dated 1966. So before my husband and I were even born. Um, wasn't long after her birth, within three weeks, we were working with um, the cocoon nurse and our pediatrician on changing that information that was given to parents upon a new diagnosis. We were working with physicians and nurses on what that looked like, uh, how to deliver a diagnosis, what to say, uh, a lot of different things. When nurses would come into our room, they would often say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, or those types of things. So we've, um, we started this organization when my daughter was three months old. Our physician um, <laughs> was able to introduce us to another family who had a child with similar diagnosis just eight days before our daughter Victoria was born. We <laughs> were told if we met in the um, front reception area of the pediatrician's office at a certain time, there might be another family there that had a similar experience and that we might want to connect with because he wasn't allowed to uh, give out their information or give our information to this other family. So <laughs> ironically, we showed up with our baby and uh, it was very obvious. 
who we were there to meet. Um, we started this organization at that time, the two of us families together, and it's grown ever since. We've expanded counties. We have a tremendous number of families within the network. We now have physicians that are connecting families to us. They're giving the information upon that new diagnosis. We have put together binders and all kinds of information that can be presented to families when they are receiving that initial diagnosis. Next slide, please. These are just some facts that are kind of surprising for a lot of people that we wanted to share. So one in five people experience disability in their lifetime. Disability can happen through birth, an accident, disease, or aging. It can happen at any time. People with disabilities constitute the nation's largest major or minority group and the only group that any of us be can become a member of at any time. People with disabilities do attend school, they work, they drive automobiles, have all kinds of relationships participate in decisions that affect them and contribute to our society in so many great ways. One in 54 children are diagnosed with autism, with it being more prevalent in boys than girls. According to the United Cerebral Palsy Research and Education Foundation, currently about 8,000 babies and infants are diagnosed with cerebral palsy each year. The National Down Syndrome Society estimates that Down syndrome occurs one out of every 700 births, approximately 5,000 births per year. Some things about CODSN, we um, work in a lot of small rural communities. I grew up in a very, and that's where my passion is. We work throughout Deschutes, Crook, Jefferson, Grant, Lake, Wheeler, Klamath, Harney, and Baker counties as our primary counties, and that's really where our funding is attached. That being said, we never turn a family away if they call us from a county needing help that we don't officially have funding for. We would never turn a family away. 95% of our funding comes from the Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Human Services through grants. 5% of our funding comes from donations and fundraising. So I'm going to talk some about the programs that we do offer for families and um, community partners for CODSN. One of the most important things we offer is support. A variety of different support options. We provide one-on-one -on -one support for families, uh, especially those families who are receiving a new diagnosis and may not be ready for other families support yet or a larger setting. We do provide traditional support groups for families who access their support that way. We have all different types of support groups. We have some specific for dads, some for moms, some for families. We have groups in Spanish and English, a variety of different more traditional support groups. We also do uh, what we call family fun events and that is where families can all as a whole unit come together and participate in a fun activity. Maybe it's um, bowling or a picnic in the park or some of those kinds of things. And naturally, as families are meeting each other, it's really super awesome because you see families connecting in ways before you see families exchanging information and offering to get together for play groups and all kinds of different things. It's oftentimes a very casual and more organic way for families to connect with each other. And then those relationships grow into a huge support system, which is one of the most fun things about our job. Um, we also connect families with each other. Oftentimes we get calls from families who have a child who just received a new diagnosis and oftentimes diagnoses are you know, rare or unique. And so we're able to connect those families 
with other families who have a child with maybe the same diagnosis. We currently, um, we recently just connected two families whose children were diagnosed with Rett syndrome, and one is just a little bit ahead in that journey. And so it's a beautiful relationship for those families to get together and share information and connect in ways that nobody can support them besides another family who is going through the same thing and understands that same diagnosis. So those are kind of some of the support options. Information and referral. We do have a pretty extensive lending library. We will ship books to anybody uh, in any county that needs them. We have all kinds of books and media. We also work a lot with care coordinators, physicians directly. Um, anybody who's looking for information or resources for a family can call us. We get a lot of calls from families directly who need to find a dentist who are, might be good with their son who has autism or a sensory disorder. We get a lot of specific requests. So any of that type of stuff we can definitely help with. Um, the next thing, um, you want to advance, thank you. Uh, advocate. We do a lot of individual advocacy and helping families understand how systems work and their role in a system. We don't, we are not attorneys. We do not, um, you know, kind of, we do not represent families, but it's more of that guide by your side, like helping families to understand the system and how they can participate in a system alongside their child. Um, we do that within the medical system, educational system, social service systems, any of that kind of stuff. We also come alongside um, groups and families who want to advocate at the local, state, and federal level for people with disabilities. The next thing that I want to talk about as far as our services is training and education. So we do a lot of this. We participate in conferences like this one. We do one-on-one -on -one trainings for families who might need that more, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one type help. We do a lot of training for educators and professionals. We work with St. Charles um, Health System to do training for nurses and physicians. We've participated in the ground rounds, which many of you um, have access to. We also do um, work with local businesses to make them or help them to be more welcoming for people with disabilities and how they can their business can be more accessible and friendly for um, all people to uh, access. Next slide. At CODSN, we currently um, are working with over 2,000 families in these rural counties. We have 1,480 community partners because I am here to tell you we do this work without our community partners. You guys are amazing. Connecting families with us, helping um, with resources, and just all of the things that you do. We currently um, serve on 19 local and state committees supporting, bringing that voice, I guess, of families and disability to the table. We also, um, some of these other things are just kind of over the last year, um, some numbers. Um, we've supported 298 people to attend support groups, uh, 3,870 people uh, with the community, the family fun events that I was talking about. We've um, trained, um, had 141 people participate in our trainings. Next slide. So I would just ask um, if you guys would partner with us. There's a lot of different ways. We have, you know, a lot of volunteer opportunities, ways to donate, but mostly making sure that families in these rural communities who feel like they have no resources, who are feeling isolated, and really needing to connect with resources or each other or with their typical community. Um, if you would connect them with us, we would greatly appreciate that. Next slide. Here's our contact information. And at the end of this presentation, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
At this time, I'd like to turn over to Melissa first with Oregon Family Support Network. Thank you, Diana. Uh, my name is Melissa First. I am a family support facilitator and peer coach with Reach Out Oregon, which is an initiative of Oregon Family Support Network. Oregon Family Support Network is a nonprofit organization founded in 1991. We are the Oregon chapter of the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Our staff members are primarily uh, family members meaning we are parents, biological, adoptive, and foster, or caregivers who have and are raising young people with emotional, behavioral, and mental health challenges. Having lived through these challenges, we understand what families are, who are raising young people with complex needs navigate and how difficult it can feel at times. We're certified tr traditional healthcare workers, and we come to this work with both professional and lived experience to support other parents as they navigate their journey. Oregon Family Support Network is committed to providing services in the most culturally appropriate way. Next slide, please. A guiding principle for our work is the phrase, nothing about us without us. Families deserve to be heard and should drive the services and supports they receive. We work alongside families and community partners to bridge to build a bridge of understanding around communication and family-driven values. Oregon Family Support Network's mission is, we are families and youth working together to promote mental, behavioral, and emotional wellness for other families and youth through education, support, and advocacy. Our vision is that every family deserves to be heard and understood. Next slide, please. The families we serve navigate a wide range of experiences. Um, the families we support frequently struggle with many obstacles and barriers, including poverty, domestic violence, homelessness, disconnection from family, untreated mental health and addictions, as well as profound traumatic experiences. It is important that each family is supported in a way that feels meaningful and individualized to their family's needs. Raising youth who experience complex needs can be exhausting and overwhelming. Oftentimes, parents don't know where to look for support and find themselves feeling lost. I have been navigating systems on behalf of my young people who experience complex needs since 2005. Throughout my journey, I have felt shamed, blamed, and judged, and these experiences led me to feelings of inadequacy, isolation, and hopelessness. Similar to my experience, many families encounter barriers as they search for services and supports. Sometimes insurance is a barrier. Sometimes not understanding what our young people are experiencing make it difficult to know where to start. And living in a rural community can really limit resources available to families. Oregon Family Support Network is here to support parents and caregivers in navigating this difficult part of their journey. Next slide, please. We offer various supports to families across Oregon. We walk alongside and support families through complex system navigation, services, and supports. Oregon Family Support Network offers peer support in many different ways across the state. Community peer support specialists have the ability to offer support to families who may not meet requirements um, for other services and supports. Wraparound family partners partner with and walk alongside parents and caregivers who have youth in the wraparound process. This may look like um, offering processing support, preparing for team meetings, attending treatment appointments alongside the family, bridging communication between families and system partners, elevating the family voice and empowering families to advocate for their needs. Regional family support specialists provide short-term individualized parent support through various engagement activities in each of our four Oregon regions. Times of crisis can be especially stressful and scary for families. Navigating the emotions that come with knowing our young person is struggling to this extent, along with everything that is needed while we are in the emergency department can be so overwhelming. I have navigated this experience multiple times with both of my young people. 
As a parent, I felt scared and helpless because I didn't know how to help my child. I spent many hours and days sitting alone in the emergency department, just feeling lost. It was actually during one of these moments that I knew one day I would be sitting alongside and offering support to other families as they navigate similar experiences. Families do not have to navigate this alone. Our Crisis and Transition Services Program offers support to families during this difficult time, as well as short-term support and planning as they transition out of the emergency department. We offer multiple parent support groups across the state. We recognize that these times are unprecedented and the value families find in these groups and connections. So all of our support groups have moved to a virtual format at this time. Um, our training department offers trainings that reflect family member voice and that have been identified as topics that are helpful to families as they navigate systems on behalf of their youth. One example is our journey to advocacy training. This training supports family members in finding their voice through telling their story. This training is done in a workshop style and is designed to help guide parents and caregivers through the process of honoring their journey by recording and sharing their stories. They are able to gain understanding of how their voice can improve services and systems for children and youth with special needs and their families. We also offer Changing Systems Together, a training specific to supporting families and advocating on both local and state levels. <clears throat> Reach Out Oregon is an initiative of Oregon Family Support Network. We are an online community of support we offer a 1-800 support warm line, as well as other ways for parents to connect with each other in their community and statewide. Each week, we hold a virtual family discussion around topics that are important to families. Next slide, please. The Oregon Family Support Network website provides information to support and empower families. There is access to peer support resources for families community-specific support contact information, training and event information, and volunteer opportunities. At the Reach Out Oregon website, you will find a place that feels hopeful, compassionate, and supportive. We offer live support through our chat, through chat on our website. You will also find information for local resources, news, events, trainings, virtual discussions, and ways for families to connect with each other. Next slide, please. Reach Out Oregon is a non-crisis community of support. When I first heard about this initiative, my heart absolutely burst with so much hope and joy for families across Oregon. Reach Out Oregon offers everything I had hoped I would have found and that I needed in my journey. <clears throat> a supportive ear to listen when the day had been really hard or even someone to listen about and celebrate a good day with. I felt so alone in my journey as if I was the only parent experiencing the challenges I faced. We understand many families experience these feelings and how difficult it is to navigate when we feel so alone. There is an entire network of parents with similar experiences and we have just not known how to find each other. Our warm line staff is located throughout the state, including rural, urban, and frontier communities where we know challenges may look different. Reach Out Oregon is the place we can come together for support, resources, hope and sharing with people who get it. We are parents supporting parents and we offer a safe and judgment-free space to connect and share experiences. All of our chats and calls are confidential and there are multiple ways to connect with us. Parents and caregivers can chat with us live through our website at reachoutoregon.org. Uh, by calling us at 1-833-REACH-OR, which is 1-833-732-2467. Email us at info at reachoutorgan.org or chat with us through Facebook Messenger. Our live hours are Monday through Friday, 12 to 7 p.m. Families can reach out to us for support at any time, but if they reach out to us outside of those hours, we will respond the next business day. Next slide, please. Navigating supports for our youth in rural communities is different and can be even more challenging for families that don't speak fluent English. Reach Out Oregon is able to support Spanish-speaking families across Oregon. 
and our Rachel Organ website can be viewed in Spanish as well as English. Next slide, please. There are times we as parents come across a support that we feel hopeful about only to discover there is a barrier around insurance. Reach Out Oregon offers free support to families across Oregon. There are no insurance or system involvement requirements. At reachoutoregon.org, parents will find information about upcoming trainings and events, ways to connect with other parents across the state, community specific and statewide resources. Reach Out Oregon offers a weekly virtual family discussion and the link for registration can also be found on our website. Our warm line offers a safe and confidential space for families to connect with us. Families reach out to us for a variety of needs. Sometimes they need support around connecting with resources. Sometimes they can identify a support that would be helpful, but they're not sure where to find it. Sometimes parents need a safe space to come to for listening support from someone who gets it. Reach Out Oregon can support families in connecting with other supports across the state that they identify would be helpful. We are also able to connect families to our regional family support specialists with Oregon Family Support Network for community engagement and navigation support. We offer follow-up conversations to families to offer continued support as well as to ensure connections have been made and that they do feel meaningful. Sometimes parents aren't sure what to expect or where to start when they reach out to us, and that's okay too. Through conversation and allowing a safe space to be vulnerable, families are supported in processing their journey and identifying needs for their family. As parents across Oregon navigate so much uncertainty in the current times, like the pandemic, distance learning, and the recent fires, we recognize these things have created mental health challenges and big behaviors that some families have not experienced before. We are here to support all parents across Oregon, no matter where they are in their journey. Next slide, please. I appreciate this opportunity to share about how Oregon Family Support Network and Reach Out Oregon can support families in rural communities across the state. I encourage you to explore our website to learn about the supports we offer for families across Oregon. I also encourage you to reach out to us if you're curious about what our support looks like or if you'd like more information. I want to recognize that many of you here are parents too, and I wanna be sure you know we are here for you as well. We invite you to reach out and join our community of strong and resilient families. Thank you for your time, and I will now hand it over to Tamara Bakewell. Hi, thank you. My name is Tamara Bakewell, and since 2011, I've been supporting Oregon's Family to Family Health Information Center. You might have seen our materials at one or two of these conferences in the past. The center is one of 56 Family to Families around the country, and we actually thank Representative Greg Walden uh, as well as Senator Ron Wyden for being champions of funding for these family to family centers. Our center is affiliated with the Oregon Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, otherwise known as the Title V office. And in Oregon, Title V program for children and youth with special health needs is called OCEAN. And I work there at OCEAN and administer this small grant. And because I am at OHSU, I do need to let you know that officially I have nothing to disclose and uh, there's our funding information there. The funding comes from HRSA. So this is a photo of our team. Um, every one of us in the Family to Family Health Information Center, our parents, ourselves, who've experienced what it's like to love and parent a child with special health needs. Our children have a variety of diagnoses and experiences. Um, and our kids range in age from preschoolers to young adulthood. Altogether, when you add up our years of experience on this journey, we have over 120 years between us of navigating special health needs systems. Um, this is what we do. Our job is to help families navigate difficult systems. Next slide, please. So one way you can think about the family to family is that we take a very practical approach to supporting families. They call us with systems issues and barriers and we do our best to help them overcome those barriers. 
The photo on the top here is a perfect example of what a lot of us spend our days doing. We're on the phone, on hold, trying to iron out paperwork and problems alone while still trying to be a parent. The list on your right gives you an idea of the types of support that we give parents. We can help them understand more about insurance denials and appeals. We help them find resources they may have never heard of before. We can brainstorm with them solutions to financial barriers. We're also really skilled in coaching families to improve communication with their provider. So for example, we will help someone work out the language they may need to use in order to help a provider really understand what the family or child is experiencing. For example, we also might help them come up with a list of questions that they need answered or to help understand what uh, follow-up uh, instructions are going to come from a, a health system. Specifically though, our center has unique expertise in helping families manage care coordination and transition to pediatric and adult health care. So I've worked in this field for a number of years and I would like to share that most families are unaware of what weights them in terms of the numbers and the uh, difficulties of systems navigation that, that await them. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about care coordination in depth. Okay, next slide, please. So let's take a look at an example of a family of a young child who experiences multiple physical and possibly intellectual disabilities. And let's count up all the possible support systems and individuals that this young family will likely interact with. So let's start at the top with primary care and specialty care. There may be a cocoon nurse involved. You can go ahead and click through, Rosalie. There may be, uh, they may be involved in early intervention. Likely they'll have physical, occupational, or speech therapy that's provided at school, but they also may have it in the clinic setting. They may need or require a mental health or behavioral therapist. There may be specialty foods, specialized pharmacy, transportations, car seat, private health insurance. They may have or be connected to their CCO's exceptional needs care coordinator. Again, pharmacy and sometimes compounding or specialized pharmacies. They may require the services for, from the developmental disabilities uh, agency. If they need eligibility, they will also likely have a care coordinator through the medically involved or the medically fragile behavior or behavior waiver. Depending on their needs, they may actually need to inter interact with uh, specialty medical vendors as well. And last of all, if the family is a, involved in the foster care system or requires other self-sufficiency services, there may be a case manager involved there. So as you can see, there are a lot of people and experiences and systems and paperwork that families need to navigate all at the same time while raising their child and trying to just be a parent. So next slide, please. This little um, illustration is, uh, I think, a good way to show what our goal is at the Family to Family Health Information Center, to take the confusing tangle of services and supports and insurances and try to provide opportunity for care coordination so that the system is a little more knowable. If you go back one slide, Rosalie, you'll see this is an example of one of the tools that we came up with years ago to help families understand that maze of providers. Um, I made this up years ago when a family member said to me, I have no idea who those people are who are coming to my house. They all look alike to me. Another time a parent told me, I wasn't sure which one of the professionals I was working with most of the time, but I knew if they were talking about my daughter learning her letters, she was probably from the school 
But if they were talking about me getting grief counseling, it was probably the hospice nurse. And those are two examples right out of the mouths of families who say, this is hard. We love our kids, but we don't love the, the paperwork and the systems and the difficulties and the barriers that come with raising a child with special health needs. Next slide, please. So although it would be interesting to tell more stories along those lines, there are certainly plenty of them. We'll just tell you how the family to family tries to help with this. Um, in a nutshell, we do just a few things. We have one-to-one -one support through a phone line that is uh, staffed in both English and Spanish. We uh, publish uh, condition-specific toolkits and tip sheets that are really guides for how to navigate healthcare systems. We offer uh, six different free trainings. We have a very intense website with lots and lots of materials on it. Uh, I do want you to know that one of the first things we always do is refer to organizations like CODSN and Oregon Family Support Network. Our office sits up at Markham Hill, the phone sits there, but we really are connected to every single family group in the state of Oregon. And um, our job is not to try to do all of the support ourselves, but is to link families in the communities where others are like them. And so we consider OFSN and CODSN prime partners in this work. Next slide, please. It's often helpful to let you know what we don't do. And one of the things that we, some of the things that we're not able to do is we cannot do personal advocacy on behalf of indi individual families. That is, we are not able to attend IEPs or to see any uh, health records. We do not have EPIC access. We are unable to do any of that for families. Our goal is generally to teach families how to advocate for themselves. If they truly need advocates, we are skilled in finding those advocates for them, however. Uh, we don't do case management. We generally do not provide specific educational navigation. We stick to the healthcare systems, and that is because, as many of you know, we do have an educational uh, advocacy organization run by parents called FACT Oregon. And so we generally always refer to FACT for any issues families have with the school systems. Uh, same with specific mental health systems. We always refer to family support network if there's something specific. Um, we do, however, really uh, specialize in health insurance and the health system. Um, we cannot transport family members. We don't provide childcare and generally we don't do home visits, especially now. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you just a little uh, visual of some of the resources that we have. Um, the top, on the top right there is a screenshot of our website. Um, I could not even begin to walk you through all of those resources because there are so, so many. And one of the things I would like you to know about our website, though, is it was written 100% by family members. Um, OHSU hosts our website on its website, which is which is good, um, but it was family members and not professionals who wrote those. If you go back one little slide, I will also share that um, the green sheet on the lower left that uh, there's two green ones, but the, on the lower left, we have worked with the Oregon Health Authority's birth anomalies surveillance system to put together condition specific sheets. These are all on our website. And when we say they're resource sheets, what you'll find there are resources for support, uh, books, toolkits, non-medical resources that families could use. Okay, next slide. Here's some more examples of what some of our toolkits look like. Um, when we write a toolkit for navigating the health system, we always work with others. So for example, our toolkit there on the right side about uh, durable medical equipment, we wrote 
in conjunction with representatives from the, the health authority. Next slide, please. So the way that people can find us is a couple of different ways. Word of mouth is one way, but sometimes we use these referral sheets. Our referral sheets are available on the website. And we have made a change in the last year or uh, the last year or so. The um, in the past, we were unable to accept providers referrals directly because of confidentiality, because we really believe that it's important that families self refer. Um, there's nothing worse than calling someone cold and saying, hi, your doctor said that you could use some support. We didn't do that. Um, but we did acknowledge that, especially now with things as uh, complex as they are and resources being so needed, we have modified our referral sheets and you as providers may refer as long as you attest that the family is expecting our call. So you'll uh, be able to have uh, a link to this referral sheet and um, I'm happy to have you send any families. We do just ask that you make sure that they know that that someone will be calling from the family to family health information center. Next slide. Um, lastly, you know, a good way to find out our activities is to check out our Facebook page. We now have one in Spanish as well as in English, and that is where uh, there will be notices about news, uh, the different trainings that we'll be doing. We promote all of the activities of our of our partners like CODSN and Family Support Network. Um, it's a really good place if you use Facebook to kind of see what's happening out there for families of children with disabilities. Next slide. Um, that's all I have for you today, and I will look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara, and uh, the other speakers that we had on today, Diana and Melissa. Um, we'll now take it to questions. All right, well, welcome and thank you so much for that fabulous se session. We have a bunch of questions that are coming in through the app and um, the question and answer box. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, speakers, please unmute yourselves and share your video if you're you're ready for the live Q and A part. So, our first question: um, How do you address travel time and expenses for families trying to receive these services? Is that question for any of us? Anybody? Anybody is welcome to answer. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll start. I'm uh, Tammy with the family to family and that does come up a lot that um, there are expenses. Uh, connected to getting your kids health care, um, we will often need to coach families on. Uh, getting those approved through a, through OHP because, of course, OHP will cover some of those. Um, we. Pretty much, you know, one size does not fit all. There's going to be a lot of solutions, and sometimes there may not be an easy solution. But basically, a, a, a conversation will get to the root of what we may do of some of those options. But uh, essentially, we will coach folks to work with their health plan to get those covered, those costs covered. Great, thank you, Tamara. Um, is there anybody else? I guess I can share. We we do have um, some grants available for families if they need to travel to us to receive any services. Um, normally, I like to come to families because families in our small communities are always traveling for everything, and so our service model has basically been like we'll come to you right now during covid though most of our services are available through um technology and so we're happy to um connect with families in any way that works for them great thank you Diane. so i can uh speak to oregon family support um reach out oregon so reach out oregon um Obviously, uh, it's all, you know, over the phone kind of thing um, as far as the support that Oregon Family Support Network offers. 
um, like Diana said, most a lot of it's virtual or over the phone. Um, but typically outside of, you know, COVID, we do a lot of travel to families. Um, and that is built in. Um, so we are funded through grants and um, community contracts and OHA. Um, and so those expenses for us to travel to them um, are worked into those. Um, and then much like Tamara was sharing, if uh, making it to an appointment or a meeting for a young person um, is a barrier, we would work with the family to get them connected to supports that might be able to help them with that. Thank you so much for your responses. Um, a question that just came in through the, the Q and a box um, and do please utilize the Q and a if, if you have questions um, from Angela. What is 1 way we can encourage awareness um, about all of your programs here in Klamath? We weren't aware of most of you. That's yeah, a great question. Go ahead. Diane. Yeah, I just typed into the chat. Um, we do have an office in Klamath Falls, and um, our office there is under the name of Family Advocacy and Support Network. We'd be happy to get you materials. Um, feel free to email me at diana at codsn.org, and we can get you materials or set up a time where we can really share everything that we have to offer in Klamath County. Great. Thank you. Uh, 1 quick question here from Rebecca. What is the behavior waiver mentioned in the F 2 F presentation? Oh, sure. The behavior waiver is 1 of the 3, uh, in children's intensive in home waivers. It's administered through DHS and the community developmental disabilities programs. Uh, uh, it is a program. With a, there is a cap on the numbers of families that can be served in Oregon. And so there may be a waiting list for those programs, but if you're interested in learning more, I suggest reaching out to your community developmental disabilities program and speak with the eligibility folks there. It is for uh, children under the age of 18, I believe, who experience uh, behaviors that require more than a typical amount of supports and services. Uh, it is a specialized program and does require specialized eligibility that is handled through DD services. Thank you, Tamara. All right, another question from the app. Do you have examples of healthcare facilities that are successfully implementing this method? Yeah, I think um that we've done a lot of work with is um, Central Oregon Pediatrics uh, in Bend, Redmond. They um, have done a lot um, to really bring services to families and really make sure families who have children with any sort of diagnosis um, or even possible diagnosis is connected with our organization. Um, they've been a really great partner that way. St. Charles too, from the time <laughs> of our first experience to now has been amazing and they've really um, welcomed all of the training and um, support that we've been able to offer for family birthing unit and physicians and stuff like that. And they too are um, a really great partner in making sure that every family that is receiving a diagnosis through them is are receiving the new parent binders and the information for our all of our organizations. So two great partners in Central Oregon. And I'll add in that up at uh, the NICU, we have one of our family to family health information center uh, parents who is available for family support and we receive referrals from the NICU at OHSU. Um, and then also in, not affiliated with our program, but Salem uh, Health, the rehabilitation program for children there actually employs a parent as a peer to uh, help with systems navigation. And also there are some uh, other uh, 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 clinical practices that also have parents involved as representatives. So it's definitely a model that's catching on is to have peer support embedded in uh, health centers, health settings and clinics. Great, thank you. 
Um, what would it take to get CODSN implemented in a county that wasn't listed? Well, so we've um, brought our services into all of the counties based off of need. And so it would just really be a group of local people contacting us to say, hey, how can we do this? That's exactly how we ended up in Baker and Burns and Klamath Falls and all these other places um, because there's a need and there's an interest and there's a passionate parent or two that um, wants to work um, part time sharing and doing this work. So uh, you can reach out to me by phone or by email at Diana at CODSN .org, and we can talk more about that. And one more question for you, Diana, before you. Just pause there. Um, are you all focusing on childhood disability or disability across the spectrum? Age spectrum? Yeah, so a lot of our families do have kids birth to age 26. That being said, um, we have a lot of families who, you know, in our communities, there aren't a lot of resources. So we work with really anyone um, who needs to get connected or needs, you know, resource information or referral, those kinds of things. We don't turn any family away if their child is 36 or if their child is three. <laughs> so. Beautiful. Thank you. And a question to you all. What are the best resources? Um, available to rural health care to rural health workers for child care. Could you repeat that question? I want to make sure I heard. Uh, the best resources available for rural health workers uh, to support child care. Do they mean like um, children with diagnosis that are in child care? Um, based on the topic of these pre this presentation, I would assume so, but it wasn't uh, specified. Yeah, so under the Oregon Council of Developmental Disabilities, there is a program that used to be called Inclusive Child Care Program that just switched their name to Inclusive Partners. They have representatives statewide who can help with any child care situation, after school programs, all of that. They work with the programs to help them with resources if they need additional resources or tools in order to accommodate a child that has um, you know, additional support needs. They also provide a lot of training to the staff and programs um, who are providing the ongoing supports for kiddos. Great program. Yeah, that's who I was going to recommend as well. And then I think everyone is probably aware already of 211 Info and their dedicated child care line. Um, they, they don't go into the same uh, uh, depth of services that Diana just described, but just in general for a starting place for child care, uh, I always recommend 211 Info, a simple call there, and they uh, cover statewide referral resource and referral for child care. Um, a, just a comment from Harriet, uh, please repeat the name of that group again. Um, oh yeah, so it's under the Oregon Council on Developmental Disabilities and it's inclusive partners. Okay, so, so we've got just a couple, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, OCDD.org will get you to the website and it's a program of the council. So that'll get you connected to. Beautiful. Thank you. And then just one final question before we wrap up, apart from finances, what are some of the biggest challenges faced and best, best lessons learned from this process? Well, I think um, aside from finances, the, the best thing uh, I think I could offer in there is that uh, let's get some support for families for that care coordination piece. Whether that care coordination comes at from the CCO level, provider level, the public health level, um, I think that's probably uh, what families would really appreciate is assistance with care coordination and and understanding those systems. 
So in my experience uh, supporting families, um, a couple of the biggest barriers are um, where to start, um, connecting with someone who gets it. Uh, I know for me as a parent, when I was navigating, it was very, very difficult to describe in words like what I was experiencing at home. Um, so with our ability to support families who are navigating these challenges, um, we can support them in kind of, you know, putting some language together that might be helpful um, to support system partners and kind of understanding what's going on. And like I said, a lot of times it's just where to start. Um, families, they're like, I don't, this is what's going on. I don't even know what to do. Um, so, you know, that's the support we offer in, you know, helping them identify like what would be helpful, where would be the best place to start, where could you go for that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I just want to read a comment here from Chuck because I think that it kind of echoes just a lot of the shared experience that you all have shared as presenters. But Chuck said he has a cousin who's employed as an adult and living independently. Thanks to programs like CODSN and much love to you all. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we've got another session here just in a couple of minutes um, at 11 o'clock. The Oregon Wellness Program, a statewide program of confidential, free, non-reportable counseling services for Oregon licensed healthcare professionals. So please join us in just a couple of minutes for that last session of our day here. And again, thank you, Melissa, Diana, and Tamara for sharing about such a uh, much needed and uh, useful program throughout the state. So thank you ladies and uh, have a lovely remainder of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.